Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, and I really hope you do, go ahead and grab them or turn them on. Head on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, We're nearing the end of this great letter. Um, And so we're going to be in chapter 15 for the next couple weeks. And we're going into section 5 of 1 Corinthians, which talks all about the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, our future resurrection. And we see that there was some confusion around what is going to happen and what did happen. And that's very relevant for us today as well, for us modern Christians, because there is still confusion within the church of what happened in the resurrection. Did it happen? Are we truly going to be raised? Or are we just going to be you know, uh, spirits hanging out on clouds eating Philadelphia cream cheese for the rest of eternity, right? Anybody remember those commercials? Right? Like, is that what it's going to be? Or is there going to be a resurrection unto life? So that's what we're going to look at today. And actually for the next two weeks as well. So three weeks of resurrection conversation. So this is the master class on the resurrection of Jesus. On your resurrection, you guys are going to be experts by the end of these three weeks. So I'm going to have a theological quiz in three weeks. And I expect you all to pat. No, I'm kidding. But it's going to be a great deep dive just before Easter on the resurrection. So in today's verse is what Paul is doing is he's setting the stage by reminding us and reminding the Corinthians of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that little introduction, let's go to Scripture and read the first 11 verses. They will be on the screen, but it's better if you've got your nose down in your own Bible too. But now... I, I, I would remind you, brothers, of the power I, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of the first fruits what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, uh, appeared in all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether Then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. There's so much in these first 11 verses that we could spend just three weeks alone on these 11 verses that, that what Paul is setting for us. But what he's doing is setting a foundation, if you will, for the question that he's going to rise in verse 14, which paraphrase is saying, how can some of you say there is no resurrection? Now they're talking about their personal bodily resurrection. And so what he needs to do is he sees that there's a a misstep happening here. A trajectory is off. So he wants to go back down to the foundation, set that firm, and then build upon that. Because Paul is bewildered by this question. He's saying, what do you mean? You're denying the resurrection? This is the foundation of the gospel. And I like what Tim Keller, sorry, Timothy Keller says on this subject. It's quite helpful. Whoop, I didn't change that. Sorry. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? Why worry? Because he's a fraud. Meaning if Jesus, if Jesus defeated death, That means that everything he says is true. It gives credence to everything he said. But if Jesus stayed in the tomb, if the the tomb stayed full, then he would be no different than Muhammad, who said a lot of good things. But everything that Jesus said, we could dismiss. Because he didn't do what he said he would do. And that was fundamentally, Jesus said he would rise again. So if he didn't do that, it doesn't matter how true the things he said before that, we could throw it all away. Out, meaning the resurrection of Christ is central to the entirety of Christianity, to the entirety of your faith. Keller goes on to say, I like the doctrine of the resurrection because it is just as hard or harsh as life itself. In other words, the resurrection is not soft. 
The resurrection is sharp and intolerable. It has a hard edge to it, meaning when you come in contact with the resurrection, you have to think about it. It makes you think. You can't just ignore it or sweep it under the rug or say, well, I'm not even going to think about that. It's sharp. It pricks you. It pokes at you. It's kind of like a pebble that gets stuck in your, to- in your shoe. How annoying is that, right? And if you're anything like me, you're lazy, so you're like, oh, I'm just going to deal with this pebble. I'm just going to walk on it like a man. And then about five steps in, I'm like, I'm not a man, okay? And I pull off my shoe, and I deal with that pebble because it's annoying. It's poking at me. And the same is with these claims of the resurrection of Christ. You can't ignore them. They keep poking at you every time you take a step, and they make you think. And you have to stop, and you have to deal with the claims that are within the resurrection of Christ. Because it comes down to this. If Jesus Christ was bodily raised from the dead, which is a real historical event, then that should change everything about our lives. It should change how we view ourselves, how we view the world, how we view our neighbors, creation, and history itself. It changes everything. But the opposite is also true. If Christ was not bodily raised from the grave, then Christianity is just false. And it's just a bunch of fairy tales that we tell each other to make each other feel better. Without the bodily resurrection, there is no hope, church. There is no peace, no salvation, no forgiveness of your sins, and you and I are just wasting our time week after week sitting on these nice padded chairs. Isn't that nice? But thankfully, that's not the case. Christianity is not just a bunch of fairy tales that we tell to each other as a form of therapy because life is hard. We have real hope because Christ lives. Right? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Right, that's why I don't sing. If he didn't rise, then he would ha- we would have no hope. And Paul's going to say that we should be the most pitied of all people. But as Paul details for us in these verses, the gospel is a historical, verifiable fact that is not just meant to be on the sidelines of the Christian life, but is meant to take prominence promptly right in the center of your life because the gospel is meant to transform you personally. So with that, we will walk through our passage today with three points. I'm a good preacher. The three-point sermon, right? It gets you out of here before you get too hungry, right? So the first is the historical reality of the gospel, then the centrality of the gospel, and then the transformative power of the gospel. So with that, if you're still taking notes, we'll get back to these, don't worry. The first one is the historical reality of the gospel. All religions, all worldviews are trying to answer the age-old question of death. What is death? Why do we die? Is there an answer for death? And and depending on which religion you are studying or which worldview you are exploring, they're going to give you a plethora of different suggestions and answers. Some are going to encourage you to try to just disassociate from death. Just ignore it. Deny it. It's it's kind of like trying to transcend death or disassociate from it. Or others are are going to try to fight death by delaying it and put you on a never-ending search for the fountain of youth. What's that old country song? If I could find the fountain of youth, I wouldn't drink from it. Okay, anyways, again, that was, that was not planned in the script. Okay, I'm going to buy these different, you know, they're going to tell you to buy these different creams to rub on your face, put the, the, the spoons in the freezer and hold them under your eyes. Don't eat sugar, don't eat dairy, don't eat these, and all these different things. Not saying these things are bad, but when you're doing it out of this idea that I'm going to put off death as long as possible, You're doing it for the wrong reasons. And then there's this flip side where people tend to just kind of cave into death. They're like, well, death's inevitable. And they kind of just turn into Eeyore, right? Like, what's the point of living? I'm just going to die anyways, so I might as well just roll up in a ball in a hole and die and just succumb to it. However, all these approaches, although there are some good in some of them, they all fall short. They don't satisfy. They don't have answers to the questions of death. They skirt the issue, leaving you with more questions and fundamentally leaving you with absolutely no hope whatsoever. Denying death, ignoring it is not an option because death is unavoidable. When you're young, it's easier to do that. But as you get older and you get closer to the grave, it becomes more and more prominent. 
Now, I don't know who this comedian was, but someone sent me a video once, and there, uh, don't look up who he is, because I don't know who he is, and I can't justify that everything will be good. But he was talking about this idea of, you know, kind of being on a treadmill, you know? When you're young, you're like, uh, life is good. And then you get into, like, your 30s and 40s, you're like, hey, what's happening down there? Oh, I don't know. People are screaming and falling. Okay. And, uh, and then you start getting to your 50s and 60s, you're like, oh, this is getting a little close. <laughs> that was my friend. He fell off the treadmill. And then eventually you fall off as well. And he's talking about this idea how we just try to deny death all the way until we get to the end, and then we just tip over into it. But that's not how we're supposed to look at it. Delaying death is only temporary because death is universal. And embracing death is unsatisfying because death is actually, believe it or not, unnatural. For a religion to offer meaningful insights into death, it must engage with the realities of life and death within the context of human history. It should provide strength in acknowledging death's inevitability, in solace against its pervasive nature, and instill optimism despite its unsettling presence. And the Christian gospel is the only one that stands firm and clear and rooted in the here and now, refusing to detach itself from worldly affairs. The gospel doesn't shy away from death, but rather it confronts death directly within the tapestry of human history. It's amazing. The gospel isn't just a concept. Neither is it a philosophy. It's a narrative. It's, an, it's a story that has unfolded within the course of history, and, and it singles around a singular individual. And that individual is Jesus Christ. The gospel centers on Jesus, right? In his incarnation, meaning when Christ took on flesh and dwelt among us, in his perfect life that he lived, in his substitutionary death that he died, in his burial, in the tomb, in the rich man's tomb, and then he was bodily raised from that grave. The center of the gospel is Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Because get this. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how good of a life he lived. It doesn't matter what his death was like. Because if he stayed dead, then it doesn't matter. But the fact is that he rose. So everything that he claimed comes to fruition and is true. This is why many start to try and attempt to dismiss the resurrection as a non-historical event. That it was just a fabrication of disciples that that were spread throughout the region and got a little out of hand. And as Paul says, though, in verse 4, that that, that Christ rose not just out of nowhere, but in accordance with Scripture. Meaning this is a historical reality that we can follow. The resurrection would have been just as unbelievable to the first century person as it would be to the modern individual today when we're living in our more scientific age. So to dismiss the idea of the resurrection as a non-historical event, you must, as William Lane Craig says, deal with these four realities. So these next four points I just ripped off from William Lane, William Lane Craig because he wrote it better than I did on his, on his titles. And then I filled in the rest, okay? So the first historical reality, number one, is the burial of Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 4 that Jesus died according to Scripture and that he was buried. Right? Look at, remember the gospel accounts. Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in his personal tomb. Now, here's just, I have to do one bunny trail, okay? Forgive me. Now, it's interesting. When you read about Joseph of Arimathea's personal tomb in the Greek, it actually says virgin tomb. Because remember, it's a tomb that nobody is laid in. So it says virgin tomb. And what's interesting about that is that Jesus came into the world through the virgin womb and left the world through the virgin tomb. It's really, really neat, but that's not any point to the sermon at all. It's just, okay, so just a little fun free fact for you. But Joseph of Arimathea, he, he buried him in his personal tomb, which was guarded by Roman guards. So this is a known location that could be checked. And Joseph of Arimathea was also a member of the Jewish court, the same court that condemned Jesus to death. So why would these people, they're trying to fabricate the story, pick a witness who is part of the very council that condemned Jesus to death, unless it really happened that way. Why would they make it up that way? Unless they're just telling it how it happened. The second historical reality is the empty tomb. So the tomb obviously was empty, and what's interesting about this, as we see in verse 4, it says Jesus rose, meaning the tomb's empty. I know that's, that's a very scientific fact right there, but he rose, and, and, it's, and, and it's amazing when you think about the fact that God used female witnesses to witness 
the empty tomb first. And you might be thinking, well, why is that significant? Well, in this day and age, the testimony of a woman was considered worthless in a Palestinian court. So why would they again use other witnesses that were worthless in their day if they were trying to fabricate a lie? Unless they were just telling it how it actually happened. If they were going to try to make this up, they would have tried to use a stronger witness base. But, but if they're telling it just how it happened, then they have no need to fabricate it. This is actually why one of the fundamental reasons that C.S. Lewis came to faith C.S. Lewis, who was an Old Testament, or sorry, not Old Testament, he was a, a, a professor of antiquities, and he studied all ancient writings, and he started looking at the New Testament and the Old Testament, and he starts going, wow, these are meeting more quota than other ones that we are establishing as true, and he became a believer of it. And this is one of the facts, is that the Bible never tries to elevate their leaders and make them shiny. It doesn't try to fabricate things. It actually self-deprecates itself. De- no, that's the wrong word. Deprecates, not defecates. Um, Woo, this sermon's a fun one today. Uh, Yeah, anyways, uh, it deprecates itself. And and, and this part of the reason that, that, that Lewis became a believer. Everyone agrees fundamentally that the empty tomb was empty, either by the resurrection or some other explanation. The third is historical reality number three, which is post resurrection appearances. So verses eight to four says that. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scripture and that he appeared to Cyphus and then to the twelve and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, which is Bible talk for dead. And he appeared to James and then all to the apostles and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Jesus appeared to all the leaders of the church, to the disciples, and then he also appeared to Peter and Paul and to the apostles. And if he only appeared to those groups of people, it would make sense that that some people would doubt the veracity of the sightings. But Paul also says that he, he appeared to more than 500 brothers, most of whom are still alive and could have confirmed or denied Paul's claim. And that doesn't count these 500 brothers' wives or children that might have been there as well. The Bible doesn't record that. So that could also be about 1,000 or so people that he appeared to. 500 rational people who did not have a category for seeing a person raised claim to have seen the risen Lord Jesus. It's amazing. The claim itself is a historical reality. Historical reality number four is the reaction of the early disciples. So the early disciples had every reason not to believe in the resurrection of Jesus unless he was actually raised from the dead. Their leader was dead, and now they were all Jewish people, so they had a Jewish mindset, and they saw their leader upon a tree dying, which in Old Testament terms means he's a condemned heretic under the curse of God. Nevertheless, these Twelve, these, these disciples and others, they were willing and prepared to die over their belief in the resurrection of Christ. In spite of the fact that there's no benefit to them in believing the resurrection, they chose to defend this claim at all costs. They were not getting rich off of this. They were dying off of this. They were dying off of this. There is no way around these four historical realities. They must be explained, and you can't dismiss the resurrection without dealing with these four historical facts. And all the theories against the historical resurrection fail because they violate one of these four historical facts that we just looked at. Meaning that the historical resurrection of Jesus is the only option that makes most sense. One must come up with a more compelling alternative explanation if one wishes to deny the historical record of Scripture. The skeptic, if that's you watching online today or sitting in our chairs, you must come up with a historically feasible account, an alternative explanation for why there was an empty tomb, why there was an established burial, why there was eyewitnesses' accounts, and why there was the emergence of the early church, and it didn't just pitter out. The reality is that the general population did not have a worldview to receive this truth of a bodily resurrection. In other words, if, they were, if there was simply just an empty tomb and no eyewitness testimony, or the opposite was true, then the resurrection could easily be explained. 
Think of it. If, we, if all we had was an empty tomb, but no eyewitnesses account of the resurrected Lord, then yes, someone could easily come up with a ton of different conspiracies and post them all over YouTube that they just stole the body. Even if the Roman guards were, were truly deeply asleep, what needs to be understood is that for a Roman guard to allow somebody to break into the tomb, that would fundamentally mean that these Roman guards were forfeiting their own life as well. And why would they do that for some condemned heretic? Also, the report of Jesus' resurrection would have been unthinkable as well in a Greek mind. You have to remember that this was a Greek dualistic world at this time, and they had no category for a bodily resurrection. They actually thought the body was disgusting. They couldn't get over the. That's why Paul says it's a stumbling block to the Greeks, because who wants to go back in their bodies? No, we want to transcend those bodies. We're going to talk about this more next week. So the historical data and the evidence that was presented, it challenged this worldview, and it challenges the worldview of us today as well. It's nothing new. The gospel is historical, and it takes place in real time and space, and it has implications for every human life. It has implications for you. It has implications for your family, for your neighbor, for your community. People must come up against the sharp edge of the resurrection and it will cut into their worldview and they will be posed with the question, do I believe this or not? And let me tell you, that's where the Holy Spirit begins to work in their lives. That's where he begins to move and that's where we begin to see salvation happen. So this has, by far, for the first 15 minutes, have been primarily a teaching message. And some of you like that. Other of you have been in dream world for the last 15 minutes. So if that was you, you know, wake yourself back up. We're going to transition to some more preaching now. So I get to yell at you some more. But, but, but within this passage is that the gospel is to be central to our life. It is central to everything we are, which brings me to my second point, which is the centrality of the gospel. We're going to go backwards now. We looked at verses 4 onwards. Now we're going to look at 1 to 4. Now I would remind you, brothers. No, I didn't put these in here. I apologize. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day with accordance with Scripture. Now, very quickly, when you read that, you will begin to pick up on Paul's logic of the gospel. And that is first, um, whoa, now I'm all out of order. All right. Thank you. Can you take care of that? Get me to the first point, which is preached. Uh, The first thing we see is that the gospel is something that is preached, meaning the gospel is something that that must be verbally communicated. Whoever said preach the gospel always, but when necessary use words, clearly never owned a copy of the Bible. What a dumb thing to say. Now, of course... The the gospel is going to dictate our conduct and our life and how we act and how we treat others, but our niceness and our conduct alone is not going to save someone. There are a lot of unsafe people that are nicer than a lot of Christians I know, and that's sad. Lots. So your niceness, your conduct alone, they're not going to go, wow, something's different about that guy. I better believe in Jesus. No. No. I always say, right, when you give a casserole to your neighbor, there's got to eventually at some point be a gospel message. You can't wait for the noodles to form Jesus as Lord, and they go, oh, my word, he's king, and they surrender their lives. The gospel has to be verbally preached and spoken to people. Paul says that, you know, if if they don't hear, how are they going to be saved in Romans, right? And so they don't hear, they're not going to be saved. They have to be spoken. Secondly, the gospel is something that is received. So it's preached and it's received. The gospel breaks into the hearer's life and it just stirs everything up. Right? They come up against those, those claims of the gospel, the, the resurrection, the historical claims that we just looked at, and they're posed with that question. Do I believe this or not? And again, that's the soil that the Holy Spirit loves to work in. Thirdly, Paul says the gospel is something that we stand in. Meaning the gospel is not just past tense. It's what you stand in every day. You need to be reminding yourself of the gospel every day because we're prone to forget the gospel every day. I'll refrain from singing another song. The third point is tied tightly with the fourth which is that we are presently being saved by the gospel. You see that in verse 2. Meaning the gospel is not just past tense. 
It's, pre- it's a present event that is presently saving you. This is what we commonly call sanctification. It's keeping you and conforming you to Christ every day. You never graduate past the gospel church. Paul is identifying this with the Corinthians that they're trying to graduate past the gospel, if you will, and move on to bigger, better things like speaking in tongues that we looked at last week. But Paul is saying the gospel is everything, church. You never move past the gospel. You never graduate past this. It's of first importance. That's what he says in verse 3. It's of first importance. So that's the basic outworking of the gospel. And in those three or four points, I see three common mistakes that we as Christians make pertaining to the gospel. And that is the first one. If it, there we go. That the gospel is something that happened in my past. This is a common mistake, a dangerous one. This is what the Corinthians were dealing with and many of us deal with too. That we look at the gospel primarily as just a past event and now that I'm a mature in Christ, I can move on to the more meaty things like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and and when's the exact date of Jesus coming back and what about Calvinism or Arminianism and and what about egalitarianism or complementarianism And, and we start making these things the great big things that we want to study And we neglect the gospel and we wonder why we're horrible to each other. We wonder why there's so much division within the church and hate. Because we're neglecting the very thing that's meant to keep us centered in Christ. We look at primarily as the gospel is just a past event. But now that I'm more mature, I can move on. And that's a grave problem. There is nothing more profound, church, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we believe this lie that it's just this the fundamentals or the nuts and bolts or whatever we want to call it, then we miss the present holistic significance of the gospel within our lives. This is why Paul says it's of first importance. Everything within this book is important that you should know and study and grow in. Don't hear me wrong. But Paul is saying that there is no teaching within this book that is more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is of first importance. This gospel saved you in the past, it is presently saving you now, and it will ultimately save you in the end when Christ returns in all glory. And when we look at the gospel only as a past event, we miss out on these glorious truths. The second thing that we commonly fall into is we look at the gospel as something I only need occasionally in the present. Right? We all slip, we all fall. Right? The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God, we all still sin, we all still struggle with sin. Like Paul, he even says this in Romans 7. The thing, the thing I want to do that I don't do and the things I don't want to do, I just keep doing. What's going on? I love Romans 7. 7. It's, it's just such a beautiful thing that the Apostle Paul wasn't this the glorious guy who never sinned again. He still struggled too, like you. That's important to understand. But when we get into those moments, here's the problem. We tend to just try to pick ourselves up and just try harder. Well, I'm just going to try harder. I'm just going to put my head down. We've all been there, right? We commit a sin that we know is wrong. And then we, what we do, we do, we, we pray these empty prayers to God like, oh Lord, I'll never do it again. I'll never, ever, ever think of doing this again. Just keep it from me. And then we try really, 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 really hard. And then what happens? We do it again. And then we say those same prayers again. Oh Lord, I'll never do it again. I promise. I know I said that last time, but just forgive me of that too. And, uh, and then we try really, 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 really hard. And what happens? We do it again. And some of us were wondering why we're still stuck in the same sin that we were dealing with for 20 years or more. And it's because we're not embracing the gospel. We are trying to solve our own sin issues out of our own strength. And that's not going to work, church. It's not going to work. This is going to leave you high and dry and constantly falling into the same sin over and over and over again. This mindset will put you on a never-ending treadmill of trying to earn God's favor. But guess what the gospel tells us? We have already, in Christ, earned all of God's favor. We have already, in Christ, earned all of God's acceptance. We have already, in Christ, earned all of God's love. And nothing you can do, no matter how hard you try, can earn any more of it. Because you have it all in Christ. That's a beautiful reality. That removes you from the works-based mentality that so many Christians fall into, which we shouldn't, if we're truly understanding Scripture. God doesn't look down to me and go, my golly, Aaron, if you would just read your Bible one more day a week, it would make me love you a lot more. Make it a lot easier if you would just pick up your slack a little bit. No, Christ knew we couldn't pick up the slack. 
we got to reject this picture that we were out to sea and swimming and trying to reach our way to God and then he threw a life uh, preserver out to us and pulled us in. No, you didn't. You were dead at the bottom of the sea. He had to go down there and pull you out and expel the water out of your lungs. You did nothing. You can't do anything to earn more of God's love. And Christ knew that. That's why he was willingly dying for you and me. We need to correct our thinking around the acceptance we have in the gospel because when we live in a works-based understanding, we miss out on the doneness of the gospel that ensures the security of our future in Christ. It's kind of like when you overbook or overcook a cookie, right? Bake a cookie. They still maybe look good, but you break a tooth when you bite into those suckers. It also ignores the constant daily ongoing need that we need for grace. Romans 5 and 6 talks about this, where where God knows that you're going to sin. That's why he gives us grace. But he says grace is not a license to sin, but rather it's the net that catches you when you do sin. Right? He goes through chapter 5. You should read it. It's really beautiful. And he makes this amazing case for grace. He says grace is so profound that no matter how deep you dive into sin, grace still abounds. And then it's like Paul goes, wait a minute. I can see what could go wrong with this. Then he starts off verse 6 going, well, shall we send more to have more grace? May it never be. Basically, if I, if I was writing, I'd say, don't be so dumb, right? That's not what I'm saying. But grace is this net because he knows you're going to sin, and no matter how grave that sin is, he catches you. But it's not a license to sin that you go, well, I'm just going to go do this, party it up on the weekend, and do everything I want to do in my life because God will forgive me on Monday. If that is truly your heart that you operate out of, not once in a while or you fall into, but that's truly your heart, I would question whether you are saved or not. I would question that. If you truly love the Lord or not. The third problem that we normally fall into is the gospel is primarily about what is going to happen. This is a big one, especially in Western Christianity. And this is what I hear a lot from Christians, that my Christianity is more just about the idea of my eternal destiny. I said a prayer, so I'm set and I'm going to heaven. And yes, when you're in Christ, you are set and you are headed to heaven. But when your relationship is primarily with God through the lens of what you're getting, like getting out of hell and going to heaven, then you make your relationship primarily transact- transactional and that's selfish. I, you know, I, I believe the gospel out of fear or escape or desire or pleasure. And I talked about this in 1 Corinthians 13. If we serve God only in the mindset of what we get from it, then we're not really serving God. We're serving ourselves. The gospel as its whole is intended to be a part of your past, present, and future realities of your salvation experience. Meaning, you who are in Christ, your past has been settled. All the evil, all the wrong you've done has been forgiven by God. Jesus broke into space and time. He lived the life that you couldn't live, and he died the death that you should have died, and he rose again, securing your everlasting life with the Father through his resurrection. But it goes beyond your past, and it moves into your present, meaning your present is also secure in Christ as well. You can stand firm and hold fast through all of life's trials that arise. Through the pain of death and disease, through the pain of bad doctor's reports, or, or you know, you go through a series of unfortunate events, and you jump in your car, and then the check engine light comes on, and you're like, what is going on, God? Or, or my kids, they're just demons. What have you blessed me with? These crazy kids that won't listen. And it just seems like things that compound in our life, and they pressure, and they build, and they build. This is saying that you can hold fast through all of that, because God is holding you. That's the truth. I love what R.C. Sproul would say, that you're not saved because how, how tightly you hold to Jesus, but because how tightly Jesus holds to you. Isn't that beautiful? In the context of what we're talking about today, I would say that you can only stand fast and hold fast in this life because Jesus is holding fast to you. He's holding on to you. Amen. That's the gospel message that you can stand firm in. The gospel shows us that our past and our presence are dealt with, that we have been forgiven, that we've been given the power of the resurrection to overcome our fears, to overcome our temptations, to overcome our pains. But this also shows us that we who are in Christ, our futures are certain as well. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because Christ already took care of tomorrow. Our future is with him. If we die tomorrow... Or if we die in many years, ultimately our future is eternity with Christ and the promised resurrection of our body. So let's not fall into the common mistakes 
that surround the gospel. Let's, let's truly make the gospel central to our lives because only then will we live lives that thrive in Christ and that are not lacking. The gospel is intended to be the central power around which our lives revolve. If our lives revolve around other things, even being your spouse, your kids, your job, or whatever it might be, guess what? You're going to be crushed. You're going to be crushed. Because they're not meant to hold your worship. They're not meant to hold your worship, the weight of your worship. If we make our lives primarily around ourselves, you're going to implode. Because you're not meant to be your own God. Our lives need to be centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We won't be crushed because Christ was crushed for us. Amen? We will not implode because our lives will be properly aligned with Christ, meaning that we can make the gospel our firm foundation on which we stand, as Paul says. But we often look for other foundations upon which we stand, don't we? We try to look for superficial things and we push the gospel to the sidelines. And when we build our lives upon other foundations, yeah, they're going to last for a time. Yeah, you're going to thrive in them for a time. They're going to make you feel good. They're going to satisfy you and tickle you for a time. But when life gets hard, because life gets hard, right? I'm not the only one, hopefully. And life throws those curveballs at you. Your foundation that you've built upon begins to erode and crumble and fall and you're crushed. When life gets hard, we tend to reach out and hold on and look for stabilization from things that offer no stabilization at all. They're superficial. It's like this. When I lived in New York City for a few years, we used to ride the the subway station. It's not much different than Drumheller. And and so we made it into a game because we're in Bible college and we're dumb and young. And so we would try to, how, how far can we ride the subway without holding on to any of the stabilizations that they give you? But then always, it's like they knew we were doing that. The train would take an, a hard jerk or hit the brakes out of nowhere because someone jumped on the tracks or something. And, and you'd just go flying. And you'd reach out and try to grab on to all these stabilizations around you. But the problem is, when we're in, in Christianity, what we tend to do is, is that we, 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 we've been given something that, that gives us firm stabilization that we can hold fast to, that can help us through all of life's certainties. Yet what we tend to do is try to balance ourselves and play games and hold on to other alternative stabilizers that often no, offer no stabilization at all. Be it money, well, if I just have more money, I'm going to be more stable. Be it food, well, I don't want to think about my problems, so I'm just going to stuff down a ton of, ton of food down my throat. Be it acceptance, I just want to please everyone, so they tell me how amazing I am. Be it pornography, I just want to escape into an alternate reality of, of pleasure because I'm not happy with where I'm at. And the list can go on and on and on. Relationships, I move and burn through friendships or romantic relationships left, right, and center because I am trying to hold on to something that brings me stabilization but always leaves me worse off than when I began. Church, you who are in Christ, your only stabilization is Christ. It's only Jesus. He will stabilize everything, and he proved this in his resurrection, showing you that the worst of this life has been dealt with. It has been defeated. The worst that this life can throw at you is death. What are you going to do, kill me? The worst that the life can throw at you has been dealt with. He overcame death, both physical and spiritual death. So the gospel is unmistakably historical. It's necessarily central to your life. And lastly, and very quickly, it's also transformative to your life as well. Look at verses 8 to 10 with me as we begin to close. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. But on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. I love these verses, because these verses kind of tell us, Paul is saying that the gospel is something that can be experienced. And that's true if you think about your life. If you're in Christ, we have all experienced the gospel at some point. Something happened that made you want to commit and surrender your life to Christ, and now your life has been completely transformed by the power of this gospel. The gospel is more than just words that we hear. The gospel is the power that we experience, the power unto salvation, the power to make a believing, or a, a, a dead heart believing. The power to make a sinner 
into saints. In Paul's case, the power to make the persecutor of the church who persecuted the church fiercely into one of the leading figures of the early church and wrote 13 of the New Testament books and ultimately ended up dying for Christ. All of us who feel unworthy today need to slow down and listen to what Paul is saying to us. Paul is recounting his life. Paul hated Christ. Paul hated the church. Paul breathed threats against it and wanted to kill and persecute the ones who were serving Christ. And Paul realizes this and he says, man, I'm the least of all the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. But I am what I am because of what? God's grace. You who feel like you've sinned too much, you who feel you've messed up too much or you've wandered too far or you've gone too far, Paul says, no. The great, it's only by the grace of God that you are saved. And it's, it's only an understanding of your unworthiness of that grace that makes you worthy of salvation. If God can change Paul and use Paul, he can change you and use you too. Don't believe the lie from the devil that you've done too much that you've said too much, that you've sinned too much. That's a lie from the pit of hell, and it's not true in the slightest. What the gospel does is it decenters you and I from being the center of our lives, and then we can begin to realize just how much we are unworthy. We recognize that we are only who we are by the grace of God. The gospel now becomes our functional identity as Christians. And, and think about this. Without effort or work, you and I who are in Christ were instantly placed into a perfect relationship with a thrice holy God. You didn't have to take an exam and see where you scored. And he goes, ah, maybe go to your purgatory a little bit. No, he says instantly by the work of Christ, you've been placed into relationship with God a perfect relationship, and you've experienced all the benefits of that relationship in Christ. Jesus' incarnation, him coming down, taking on flesh, communicates to us that Jesus will always meet us where we are, no matter where it is. His perfect life tells us that we who are in Christ are perfectly accepted by God regardless of your ability to be righteous. His substitutionary death means that you and I, who are in Christ, we no longer need to fear the the, the, the punishment for our sins because Jesus has bore them all. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. His burial means that his death on our behalf was no farce. That it was something that goes beyond this and, and it replaces the consequences of death with everlasting life. His resurrection means that death is defeated, that death has been stripped of its power and of its sting. You who are in Christ will ultimately be raised to new life because of your union with the resurrected Christ. The results of this free, full grace is that Christians live their lives to the full. Look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. The grace of God does not create laziness, but it actually works in you to lead you towards deeper engagement. His incarnation leads you to put others before yourself because you, you, can, identi- you can accommodate others because you have experienced divine accommodation, accommodating grace. Jesus' life and teaching leads individuals to lead lives of compelling, sacrificial love. His death enables us to live free of guilt and sin and to be certain of God's acceptance and approval. Rather than trying to wash yourself all free of guilt, making yourself look all prim and pretty, uh, you are free to live in light of God's full acceptance with a cleansed conscience. And he begins to work out the rest in your life through the process of sanctification. His resurrection enables you to take some risks. Christians should be the the most risk takers on this planet because we should be fearless in the face of death. The ultimate enemy has been defeated, so all of our minor enemies have been stripped of their power. We are enabled to work harder, Not for building a reputation or identity or security. We already have all those things in Christ. We don't even work from our own power. Rather, we work from the grace of God that is within us. 
Martin Luther was absolutely correct when he spoke of the gospel of being outside of us, extra nos, alien righteousness. Our relationship before God is not dependent upon how we feel about ourselves or our progress in the Christian life at any given moment. Your righteousness, your salvation is based upon Jesus Christ alone. That's got to be a bigger amen. 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 That removes all that guilt, that removes all that striving hard, and that enables you just to live and thrive. Your salvation depends upon the death of Christ, that he died in your place, and the resurrection that he rose on your behalf. Our salvation was accomplished on a Roman cross 2,000 plus years ago, one Friday afternoon, a short walk outside the walls of Jerusalem. This is why we can say that the gospel is something that is grounded in the objective, objective facts of history, that Jesus did die for your sins, and he was buried, and he rose again to give you new life. We can trust in that. We can trust in that. So do you believe that? Do you believe what Jesus did for you saves you from your sins, that he will rescue you from facing the judgment of God on the day of judgment? Make that your life. And if you're here and you don't believe that, Well, there's no better day than today to come to the Lord, confess your sin, cast your cares upon him, because as Nikki read for us, he is gentle and lowly. He is understanding. He is patient. And he loves you. He understands you. So come to him, all who labor and thirst, all who are hungry and thirsty. Come and drink from the well, and you'll never thirst again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Father, I thank you, O Lord, for your faithfulness Father, your ultimate faithfulness was proven to us in you rising your son from the dead. For if he stayed dead, then we would be the most pitied of all people. We would be fellowship joke church. It wouldn't make sense to come here. But Lord, you did rise. And what you said is true. And your words are life unto salvation. Father, may you just drill that deep into our hearts. That we would begin to fundamentally live from the idea that it's not about how Hard I try to earn God's grace, but I've already received it. And now I get to live from that. I get to, as Paul says, work hard in light of that, not for it, but with it inside of us. Free us from the burden of trying to work out our own, our own, our, our, our gain, or work for our own gain of salvation or our own gain of your righteousness because we've already been given it in the full in Christ. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you've done this on our behalf because we could never do it without you. Praise you, O oh God. As we lift our voices to you, would you hear our sweet melodies and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.